Hey everybody, Andre here, and today we are going to talk about kind of a fun little thought experiment. So imagine you are stuck on a desert island, and somehow you have access to a magical stereo system that doesn't need any power, um, but it can only play ten pieces of music. What ten pieces of music? would you choose? So this is something that my friends and I, my colleagues, my students sometimes we talk about this and it's kind of interesting to think about. It's very difficult I, I find to come up with a definitive list especially one that is consistent over time because of course your musical tastes evolve as you as you grow. So for this video I, I really tried to uh, limit myself so that uh, this list is, is even remotely possible to put together. So the first criteria is that I'm only limiting myself to classical music. And by that I mean, you know, art music from all generations, um, but basically not pop music. Not pop music, not rock, hip hop, jazz, just sticking to classical music. The next criteria is that I don't want to use any repeat composers. So one piece from a single composer, no, no nothing like that. Okay, so I'm not gonna choose all the symphonies by Beethoven, that would be cheating. The third criteria, and this is kind of uh, kind of an interesting thought, so you're stuck on a desert island, um, and you wanna balance in your life, right? So each of these pieces I find strikes a beautiful balance of both emotionally stimulating and intellectually stimulating art. Uh, and that's really, really important to me. Just in general, I, I find that that's the kind of music that I, I tend to gravitate towards. I don't like an easy listen. I like something that really makes me feel something and makes me feel something like in totality, not just, oh, this sounds awesome. You know, that's only one piece of the one piece of the puzzle for me. I want to I wanna be able to dig deep. And I want to be able to listen to a thing over and over again and not want to just, you know, go crazy, right? So some of these pieces I have legitimately listened to thousands of times and uh, I'm still never getting bored. Last uh, piece of criteria here is that uh, no music from uh, people that I know, uh, my friends, colleagues, uh, even remotely no. Uh, because that would just be awkward. <laughs> so, this is my list of top 10 uh, Desert Island pieces. Uh, here we go. By the way, I forgot to say that uh, I'm not gonna be including audio of these clips here just for copyright reason, but I will post the, the links to my favorite performances that are available on YouTube in the description below and in the a pinned comment. So do go listen to these pieces. You will not regret it. So number 10 is Caroline Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices. When I first heard this piece, I had difficulty getting my jaw up off the floor. I mean, it blew my mind. It honestly blew my mind. The, the, the range of vocal color and technique that was used in this piece just like you, you really it's amazing because you don't even realize that that kind of stuff is possible I mean borrowing techniques from all around the world uh, various cultures being showcased uh, in the piece uh, from you know overtone singing and these guttural sounds it's just it's really amazing and it's interspersed between more traditional sound as well. Um, it's a four movement piece. It was uh, debuted on the Roomful of Teeth's, Teeth's uh, album back in 2012 and uh, it won a Pulitzer in, in 2013 and um, I think it's about 25 minutes long. Uh, I've only ever heard it performed by Roomful of Teeth. I feel like it's uh, a very challenging to, to replicate but uh, perhaps another group has done it. Um, but yeah, a raw emotional experience particularly the the second movement the sarabande it uh there's something about the development of it over the course of the of the movement it's like a slow roll with repetitive uh repetitive motives that are constantly being developed and developed uh 
and it starts off with just the the treble voices and then the the lowers come in later uh, and just the the way it develops is is just phenomenal so you should absolutely check it out okay number nine is uh johannes brahms is uh Intermezzo in A major. It's part of Opus 118. It's the second movement of the six. Um, there's just something really, really beautiful and magical about this piece. It was written uh, in uh, 1893, so towards the end of his life. Um, it's not that virtuosic compared to other pieces. Uh, other pieces uh, really showcase uh, some some remarkable technical ability. Uh, by the pianist who performs it, but this one, it's 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 not simple, but it's uh, kind of a gentle, flowing piece of music. But what constantly brings me back is the economy that Brahms uses with regards to the motive and the motivic development. It's just it's a master class in. You, a real economy of means. There's the da 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 da. This motive just keeps coming back in different ways. There's it's inverted, and it's just it's just a beautiful composition where no note is out of place. And every time I come back to it, I find something different. You know whether it's whether it's a harmonic color or a motive or a motivic development that I didn't catch, or maybe a rhythmic thing. Brahms absolute master of rhythmic subtlety and so it's written in 3-4 but is it actually in 3-4 certainly not the whole time so yeah the Brahms intermezzo in A major opus 118 number two number nine on my list so my number eight choice is Olivier Messiaen's quartet for the end of time um, this piece was written when Messiaen was a prisoner of war when the Nazis invaded France uh, he was taken as a prisoner, and uh, he spent the time uh, back in 1940, I believe, and he sketched this piece while he was in this prisoner of war camp, and it was eventually premiered in 1941 by people who were also members of this prisoner of war camp. So, re re remarkable to know the pain and suffering that was felt while this piece was being conceived. Uh, and just you know, knowing the kinds of atrocities that were going on in those in those camps, you know, it really it really impacts how you perceive the music. It really does. Um, so the piece, the quartet's written for um, violin, cello, clarinet, and piano. And uh, as with a lot of Messiaen's language, it's very rich in interesting texture and color. It's not tonal, but it's not random. You know, it's all very, very tightly constructed and uh, beautifully composed and beautifully put together. Uh, and it's an eight movement piece. Uh, it's so with the, the the first movement, the Crystal Liturgy, to me is just the when you hear those opening bars, you can just feel the pain. You can just feel the pain of all those of all those countless people who who you know, didn't make it and it's 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 devastating it really is devastating yeah this piece and you can spend a lifetime unpacking all of the different harmonic and motivic and rhythmic details that Messiaen put in there but uh, yeah a perfect blend of emotional and intellectual uh, uh, yeah it's just I, I, I don't even know what else to say. It's it's a remarkable piece of music that everyone should know and listen to. So that's my number eight choice. Number seven on my list is a similarly emotionally charged piece, uh, and it's the Shostakovich uh, String Quartet number 15. Uh, and this one was written, it's one of the last pieces, I think it's the fourth or fifth final piece uh, that Shostakovich wrote in his life. Um, it was, uh, it was composed back in uh, 1974, and it's a uh, six-movement-long string quartet that is just... <sighs> when, I, when I hear it, you can just feel the anguish. You can just feel the resignation of Shostakovich as he dealt with the 
coming to terms with the end. I mean, he suffered from chronic health issues his whole life um, before uh, eventually succumbing to all of the all of the disease. I, I believe he suffered with ALS for for at least the last decade of his life. The 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 page really shows the pain. Um, in particular, that first movement, which is the longest uh, of of the six by far, uh, it's this long fugue based on a on a folk melody. And there's just something about it. There's just something about it. I haven't gone and analyzed it. You know, I've listened to it a, a bunch of times, but I've never actually sat down and, and analyzed you know what makes it tick. But uh, the, the fugue, it's it's really remarkable. It's really remarkable. Uh, and it's another one of those pieces where. Uh, Knowing a little bit of the backstory definitely helps to experience it. Uh, not to say it's not a valid piece without the backstory, but yeah, if I if I found myself in kind of a dark place and I needed to listen to something really emotional, uh, this would be this would be one of the top choices. So much depth of emotion in it. So yeah, Dmitri Shostakovich String Quartet number fifteen is my number seven choice. Okay, my number six choice is Johann Sebastian Bach's Jesu Meine Freude Motet. Um, this is a special one. This is uh, one of Bach's most amazing works, and that's saying something because Bach wrote a whole boatload of amazing works. And I don't know, there's something about this one. There's something about this one. It's First of all, it's long. It's 11 movements, uh, and it's very diverse. So there's a lot of different kinds of forms uh, showcased in these 11 movements. I mean, you've got you've got chorale settings, you've got fugues, you've got a trio in there, you've got a choral fantasy. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of, uh, uh, of, of musical approaches in there. Um, it's one of the very few pieces by Bach that are in five parts, which is kind of fun. Um, and the counterpoint. I mean, the counterpoint. It's just from another universe. <laughs> uh, especially knowing the kinds of procedures that composers were working with at the time to create uh, the music that was popular at that, at that point. I mean, wow. What a mastery of the technique. Not a note out of place. Everything is just perfect. <laughs> it's just perfect. And uh, yeah, very well developed, amazing flow, really well paced. It's so hard to get bored. It's just, it's, it's everything you want from, from, from a, a Baroque piece, uh, a real masterwork. Uh, I, I, t I tend to not use those kind of like, what is a masterpiece? I don't really use those words, but this one, I might make an exception. It's pretty, it's pretty glorious. So yeah, number six, J.S. Bach, is a Minor Freud Motet. Number five is Sofia Gubaidulina's Chacon for solo piano. Uh, this was uh, an early piece of hers, uh, written back in 1962. Uh, and it is, it's a remarkable piece of music. If you've never heard it, uh, I heard it for the first time, maybe like six years ago, seven years ago. A, a, a friend of mine performed it uh, live in Germany, and, and uh, it really blew my mind. So, uh, very, very powerful piece of music, and um, it's like it, it takes a classical form, you know, a, a chaconne, and it inter interlaces it with this remarkable chromaticism just out of this world harmonic development i mean it's not tonal it's not tonal at all um but it's not atonal right there's just it's all very well controlled and uh, yeah wow it's just a remarkable a remarkable composition and especially that opening powerful those those first chords just like they dig deep into your soul, and then when it comes back later, there's this there's this long section that seems to go on for an eternity, just this this turning and this turmoil, 
and then gets more agitated, agitated, agitated. Energy. Silence. Chord. And it's that return from the beginning. And just like you're, you just melt into your seat from the emotional overload. Uh, that's my experience of this piece. Uh, so I haven't gone and done a, a, an analysis of it. And I don't even think I want to really. Maybe if I'm stuck on a desert island with nothing to do, uh, I would analyze this piece. But there's just uh, is a real, there's a real power behind this 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 piece I and mean, just that the return especially the return of that initial motive i mean just i don't know just thinking about it it's giving me goosebumps it's just one of those pieces of music uh that you she just have to experience so if you don't know this piece sofia gubaidulina chacon all right number four is beethoven's string quartet number 14 this is uh, one of his last pieces that he wrote uh back in 1826 and uh, it's a seven movement piece designed to be played with each movement flowing into the next so there's no break 40 minutes and uh, it's a remarkable musical achievement uh, it really is uh, I've listened to the whole thing uh, several times um, but it's really that first movement that I keep coming back to the fugue it's a real remarkable compositional achievement um, Everything kind of works perfectly together, um, and there are surprises. You know, there there are times when you think a phrase is going to come to an end, but then it keeps going, and it's it, it's it's like constantly developing. And every time I hear it, I hear it a little bit differently. Uh, I he, I hear the relationships between between the members of the quartet changing. It's just a really beautiful piece of music. Uh, and I think it was it was one of Beethoven's favorites that he wrote, which is kind of fun. Um, so, yeah, string quartet number fourteen, uh, especially that opening fugue, uh, pretty amazing. And I think what makes it even more kind of as astonishing is that knowing at the time there was very little in the way of like motivic referencing over the course of a piece, but knowing that in the finale, Beethoven went back and referenced things from the first movement, and then you hear it after that long development, and then it comes back, and it's like, whoa, I remember that. And if you put yourself into the shoes of, 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 a, of an early 19th century listener who would have never experienced something like that, your, your mind would have just been blown. So. Yeah, knowing a little bit about that helps. Um, but yeah, musically, a very rich composition with, uh, with tremendous depth. Uh, and you can spend a lifetime unpacking all that intense chromaticism uh, and still not understand it. Um, I mean, really, really intense chromaticism in that fugue. I, so there are some sections. That, they, they sound like they were written yesterday. They sound like they were written in the 21st century. Um, really fresh uh, and really, really incredible writing. Um, so if you don't know this piece, you should go listen to it immediately. Just pause the video. <laughs> pause the video, go listen to it, come back, I won't be upset. <laughs> so there's my number four. Number three on my list is uh, by Henry Purcell. It's called Hear My Prayer, O Lord. This is the shortest of the ten on my list. Um, and I could best describe this piece as a uh, three-minute long crescendo. Um, I love this piece. It's remarkable. And uh, as you probably can tell by now, I have a thing for economy. All of these pieces uh, are remarkably well constructed and uh, just really intelligently put together with how the different, the different musical material is being handled. Uh, but this piece takes economy to a whole another level. Uh, it, it, there's only one line of text. Uh, it's, hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my crying come unto thee. That's it. And three minutes of that. And uh, it's a big build uh, through the ranges. Uh, and what ends up happening as these different, uh, the, these different motives are coming in, um, it's all imitative. Uh, and there's, there are these 
remarkable, remarkable suspensions that end up happening. And these harmonies that end up happening vertically uh, are uh, it really just take your breath away. Just take your breath away. In the second half, there's one moment. There's, there's this like E flat major nine chord. And then there's like an augmented chord a couple bars later. Uh, and of course, Purcell isn't thinking harmonically. He's thinking horizontally. He's thinking about the counterpoint. Um, but the fact that these lines end up overlapping in such a way to create these moments of, of remarkable harmony um, that doesn't necessarily resolve in the way that you think it will resolve um, is extraordinary. And there, the, there are these cross, cross relations that happen um, where there's like a chord that then the same chord turns into a minor version of that chord. And so you have, you have that play, that half step play the whole time. Uh, this is a piece that I have analyzed extensive, extensively. Um, so I can say with confidence that I can listen to it about 25,000 more times uh, without getting bored. <laughs> it's just a really, really amazing piece of music that you should listen to. Henry Purcell's Hear My Prayer. Oh Lord. All right, we're getting down to it. The last two on my list. So number two is called Horizons by Peter Louis Van Dyke. And uh, this is a piece for choir, uh, six part choir. And it is based on some cave paintings that were drawn by the sand people of South Africa. Um, so Van Dyke is a, a Netherlands born composer who who settled in South Africa, and he, um, in his music, he uses a lot of uh, traditional South African uh, sound and the cultural references in his music. Um, so yeah, the there are these cave paintings that show the life of the sand people, and then there's there's this one particular painting of a galleon, you know, a European vessel uh, that came and the people saw it for the first time and and the sand people embraced these these newcomers with open arms and what did the newcomers do they slaughtered them all they slaughtered them all and it's it's really devastating shockingly devastating and the the piece itself it embodies embodies that um that story with uh, with a number of uh, a number of uh, techniques, you know there are these homophonic, beautiful sections in major, uh, in major key, which makes it even more devastating. You know when they when they get to the last climax of the piece, and there are vocal percussion sounds, there are body percussion sounds. It's a very dynamic piece of music, and it utilizes silence as a motive which uh, people forget that silence is a part of music. You can't, have, you can't have music without the absence of sound. And that's what, and that's what silence is. And, uh, and then we can go into a whole other discussion of, you know, is silence truly silent and stuff like that. So there are these moments of, of, of intense, intense emotional rapture in this piece that are punctuated by silence and it takes your breath away it takes your breath away uh, and i i don't want to spoil it for you if you've never heard this piece um because i feel like you can only hear this piece one time without you know just like that that initial listen is like holy crap wow that is, uh, my heart has just been broken, cleaved open. But then you go back to it, and you go back to it some more, and then you just start to see how woven everything is, the structure, the the motives, and and the way that uh, Van Dyke is able to construct this piece. It it, it is just forever emotional, forever forever 
phenomenal piece of music. So highly recommend that you check it out. So that's Horizons. And finally, my number one pick for top 10 Desert Island pieces. This one's easy for me. This is my favorite piece of classical music ever written of all time. Uh, and that's the Ray Fun Williams Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis uh, for String Orchestra, <clears throat> written back in 1910. This piece, to me, it's just something really special. It's something really remarkable. The perfect blend. And I've, I've said this a couple of times now, but this really is a perfect blend of just digging down into the soul and also having a really, really intelligently composed piece of music. <clears throat> just phenomenal. It takes a, uh, a tune by... English composer Thomas Tallis of the Renaissance and uses it as the kind of cantus firmus, the, 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 the melody, the motive, uh, the, the primary theme for this string orchestra piece. <clears throat> and I, I've been working on a long-term, this is a long-term project of mine is this a big analysis of this piece. Uh, so I'm starting to get to the bottom of, of what makes it tick. Um, and I find that there's you know the the initial section there's one, there's one section and then that section kind of repeats but it goes away it deviates uh, and then there's this extended huge middle section of constant evolution and development and then at the very end we get a hint of the initial section it comes back changed and you're you're hearing that return and you're like oh that's the a section but wait there's something different about it and it's actually the completion of the second time that the theme is done so the theme this the second time the theme is 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 uh performed it doesn't get completed and it just kind of dissolves and then at the very end it's like those missing however many bars. We just had a we just had a little bit of a break, and then they finally come back with great, great climax to them. Um, there is there's a lot of time. I'm just this is another one. I'm thinking about the piece, getting goosebumps. Um, there's there's a lot of really amazing moments in this piece. Uh, uh, there, there, there are massive two T sections, and there are also solo, uh, solo points with a, a remarkable viola solo that that's in there, and there's these, these like like solo quartet that that's in there. So it's you know there, there's a there's a time with with a solo quartet and two string orchestras playing different roles, uh, which culminates in this uh, amazing rhythmically free homophonic thing uh, just blows your mind when it gets there. I can go on and on. I can go on and on. The mode mixture, the the, the thematic development, uh, everything is just, it's so exciting. It's just so exciting and it constantly builds and y you can go back to this piece a million times and find something new every time. So highly highly recommended my favorite piece of all time a fantasia on a theme by thomas tallis by rafe von williams so there you have it that's my top 10 uh, desert island pieces um i'm curious you know i'm gonna come back to this video three years from now and uh see oh has my has my uh tastes shifted at all when I replace something. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious about what you have to say. What are your top 10 desert island pieces? What would you bring with you with this magical stereo? So please leave a comment down below. I would love to hear what you think. And uh, if you haven't heard these pieces, again, go listen. I'm putting all the links in the description below and in the pinned comment. And uh, Yes, I hope this was enjoyable for you. I hope that you maybe learned about some music that you have never heard of. Um, and maybe uh, you can go out and have a new favorite piece uh, from, from here. So if you like this video, please, please hit that like button. I'd really, really appreciate it. It helps, the, uh, helps me with the YouTube algorithm. And if you like this content, just consider subscribing because I put out stuff 
occasionally. <laughs> that might be interesting to you. Um, but if you've been here this long, I just want to sincerely thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.